This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Judge John C. Fairbanks was a respected pillar of his community. The residents of Newport, New Hampshire regularly turned to him whenever they needed help. No one had any idea that all the while, the judge was quietly robbing them blind. In 1988, at a lonely roadside service center, a young woman courageously fought off a brutal unknown assailant. The surprise attack carried all the earmarks of a serial killing. Now authorities have constructed a chilling psychological portrait of a man who may be responsible for the murders of seven women. When Sue Scribner was just 13, she learned of an astonishing family secret. In 1942, her mother gave birth to twins and then gave them away. Perhaps you can help end Sue's search for her long-lost brother and sister. And a heartwarming update. Thanks to our broadcast, a father and daughter who have never met have finally found each other. Join me for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Claremont, New Hampshire, May 1984. 17-year-old Bernice Cordemash sets off for her boyfriend's house. She is never heard from again. This particular killer, I feel, does a lot of driving. And I think that what he is doing is selecting sites that are low risk for him. Can you hang on just a minute? There's this guy that... Keeps driving back and forth. It's making me a little nervous. Let me just Two months later, 27-year-old Ellen Freed, a registered nurse also of Claremont, calls her sister from a payphone. She, too, is never heard from again. Rather than stalking a particular victim, um, I don't believe any of these women themselves were pre-selected as victims, um, he selects sites, and he goes from site to site. 18 months later, the skeletal remains of Ellen Freed were found in an isolated area eight miles outside of Claremont. Bernice Kudamash's decomposed body would turn up in the same woods one mile away. Then just over a year later, the body of yet another young woman, Barbara Agnew, was found on an isolated hillside in Heartland, Vermont. It was becoming more and more difficult to ignore what seemed to be a chilling pattern. Police estimate there may be as many as 100 serial killers living among us, on our streets and in our neighborhoods. They are cool and calculating, choosing victims indiscriminately, with little or no remorse for their actions. The overwhelming task for authorities is to determine how the serial killer thinks and hopefully learn where and when he might strike again. One such investigation is currently underway in New England. Since 1978, the bodies of seven young women have been discovered within a 50-mile radius along the New Hampshire-Vermont border. Police believe that six of the seven women were abducted and taken to remote wooded areas where they were murdered. All of the victims suffered similar stab wounds and police began to suspect that the killings were the work of the same individual. I wondered if you'd take a look through these reports and give us your opinion on whether or not you feel... One With no witnesses and little physical evidence, investigators were at a standstill. As a last resort, the New Hampshire State Police brought in criminal psychologist John Philpin to develop a profile of the killer. Come over, give us your opinion on what you think. My approach is to gather as much 
of the same information that the police use in the very beginning, police reports of, of, of crime scene, um, autopsy reports, autopsy photographs, every uh, bit of information that, that would be available typically uh, to the investigators, that's what I would begin with. Profiling is something that you just, as from law enforcement standpoint, you have a belief in it works. It's not so scientific that it is absolute. It's not going to tell you this is the individual. But it does give you the type of individual that you can be looking for. If you have a suspect, it can tell you whether or not you're on the right avenue or the right approach. In the beginning, I did make several trips out to the locations where uh, Bernice and Ellen were killed. The first few times that I went was simply to, to have something of a feel for the place. When I was there, what, what could I hear? What could I smell? Uh, what was the place like? What would it have felt like to be there? How could this, uh, uh, this crime, um, this very bizarre dance between two people, how could it have been choreographed in this space? How could it have happened? When I get to the point where I'm beginning to develop some feel for what is going on in the mind of a killer, I'll go back to the scenes using what I have learned and simply going through what might have happened just as though I, I were him. I'll do anything you want. I'll do anything. What am I hearing then? Do I hear the noise of the river going by or is that blocked out? Am I so focused Come on. Uh, on the activity of killing that I don't hear that? What does it tell me uh, about this person's ability to perceive uh, in terms of sound, in terms of what I'm feeling, uh, in terms of what I'm able to see? Part of what goes on with this killer is that he has a, uh, a very strong need to take these women away alive, um, transport them, um, to the site that he has pre-selected, uh, during which time clearly he owns them. They are his to do with whatever he wishes. And part of that, I think, is this, uh, this process of, um, of scaring the daylights out of him. Midnight, August 8th, 1988, Winchester, New Hampshire. A 23-year-old woman named Jane was on her way home from a county fair when she stopped for a soft drink it was a hot, muggy evening, and Jane was seven months pregnant. If there was a serial killer on the loose, this was a perfect setting for him to find a victim. Real bad. I, di I didn't hurt anybody. It's a Massachusetts car, isn't no, it? No, it's New Hampshire. It's New Hampshire. Car <laughs> At some point, Jane tried to break away, and the killer's apparent plans to abduct her went awry. He had walked all the way to his vehicle, and by this time I was rolled over to my belly and started getting up on my hands and knees. And when he was driving by me, he just looked right down at me. He just looked at me and just kept driving. I could feel the blood rushing out of me. And I just, I thought I was gonna die. I kept telling myself, Jane, you're gonna die. That's all I could think of. And I just felt like I had to get to my friend's house to get help. 
Although Jane had been stabbed or slashed a total of 18 times, she somehow managed to crawl back to her car and drive to a friend's house two miles away. When I left the parking lot, I felt like I was going fast. I was driving fast. I was in shock, of course, so I'm really not sure how fast I was driving. But evidently pretty fast, because before I knew it, I was right behind him. And <laughs> as I was behind him, all I could think about was he was going to stop, or he was going to turn around and follow me. He left me for dead. I know he left me for dead. No doubt about that. When Jane reached her friend's house, her attacker drove on. Frank! Frank! <coughs> Up the road, the attacker turned back. He stopped momentarily in front of the house, then disappeared into the night. Miraculously, none of the stab wounds hit vital organs or Jane's seven-month-old fetus. Two months later, she gave birth to a healthy baby girl. If you feel more comfortable with your eyes closed, if you choose to close your eyes, Jane agreed to undergo hypnosis with John Philpin and was able to provide a graphic eyewitness account of her terrifying ordeal. Very peaceful, very calm feeling. From what Jane said during the hypnotic session, it became clear to me that she was not stopped. Uh, her decision to go to the fair was a last minute decision. She had no sense of uh, anyone following her, either going to the fair while she was at the fair and leaving the fair. She was able to supply very specific details of this man getting out of the car and coming up on the other side, making some remark about the telephone. That phone working? Hey, leave me alone, leave me alone, get away, get away. This man is very deliberate, very methodical, very calm. We know, especially from uh, the graphic description that Jane provided for us, that he doesn't get rattled, that he's very much in control and very patient about what it is he's doing. You hurt my girlfriend real bad. I didn't hurt anybody. He seemed so calm and so cool about everything throughout the whole thing. I mean, he never got mad. He never showed nervousness. He just was so calm, and everything was just as if it didn't bother him. What Jane described was a tremendous struggle, a tremendous amount of resistance on her part, the desire to protect her baby, but that at some point during the assault, it was as though she had done everything that she could do, and she couldn't do anymore, and she stopped struggling. And it was at that point that the assault stopped. It seemed as though the greater her resistance, the more determined he was. That as soon as her resistance began to wane, the attack ended. As you begin to drive south on the highway, what are you seeing? Um, I'm coming up behind uh, another car, and it's, um, There he is, that's him. That's him. The license plate, Jane. Focus in on the license plate. It's it's dirty. I um six six two. Um it's too dirty. I, I can't see it. That's a picture that you can hold. You can hold that picture. After getting the description, one of the things that we decided to do was see if we could identify this Jeep. In order to do that, we elicited, elicited the help of the state of Vermont, uh, the state of New Hampshire, obviously, 
in the state of Massachusetts. We generated a computer printout of all Jeep Wagoneers registered at that time in those three states matching the description that Jane had given us. Jane described it as between being a 75 to an 85. Police narrowed the search to 1,350 Jeeps throughout New England. Unfortunately, none of the leads pinpointed a suspect. Once again, the investigation was stalled, but with one crucial difference. The police still do not know who the killer is, but thanks to Jane's eyewitness description, they do believe they know what he looks like and how he thinks. I think he is a loner type of person, prefers his, uh, his own thoughts, uh, his own fantasies, uh, doesn't like uh, to intrusion. Um, I think his view of women is extremely negative uh, to the point of hostility, to the point of viewing them as uh, arrogant, uh, intrusive uh, types of people. Um, so that I, I could see him making an adjustment uh, that we might call within the, the realm of the normal. Um, but it would require, uh, I, I think, uh, um, a very limited exposure uh, to groups of people. I just feel really fortunate to be alive, but I just, I just wish he could be found so it wouldn't happen to somebody else. Maybe they won't be so fortunate like I was to live. Next, in a poignant update, a grown woman meets her father for the first time. By the power vested in me, I now pronounce you man and wife. You may kiss the bride. On November 11, 1958, 17-year-old Patsy Summers married her high school sweetheart in El Paso, Texas. At the time, only Patsy and her husband knew that she was pregnant. Seven months later, Patsy's daughter Jeannie was born. From a very early age, I felt very different and um, separated from my family. And no one intentionally made me feel that way, I don't think, but it was just a knowledge I had that was, I guess, in my subconscious. After her mother's death in 1983, Jeannie learned of a shocking secret. A passage in Patsy's diary revealed that the man Jeannie had known as her father was not her father at all. The diary detailed how Patsy had gone to a local park after an argument with her fiance. There she met a young enlisted man stationed at nearby Fort Bliss. His name was Duncan. Patsy was immediately smitten by the handsome young soldier, and they soon began dating. She never told Duncan about her fiancé, or her fiancé about Duncan. My mother, she thought of Duncan as a very kind person, and even stated that of all the people that she had known, that he was the kindest uh, person um, she had ever met. Six months later, Patsy Summers was pregnant. She was sure that Duncan was a father, but fearing her family's reaction, decided to marry her fiance as planned. There's something I want to talk to you about. Patsy, what is it? Patsy told Duncan that she never wanted to see him again. He never knew that he was the father of her child. My firm belief is that secrets only cause people harm and cause a lot of suffering. And um, that's why, for me, the truth has to come out. And I have to know who Duncan is. The night the Genie story aired, a woman named Suzanne Gilmore was watching our broadcast at her home in Lake Wiley, South Carolina. At the time, Susan's husband, Duncan, was fast asleep. Jeannie's mother had written in her diary that he was the sweetest, kindest person that she had ever met. I just said, 
that's my Duncan. I knew that it was my Duncan. And the next thing I knew, my wife woke me up, and she said, were you ever stationed in El Paso, Texas, at Fort Bliss when you were in the Army? And I said, yeah. She said, were you there in 1958? And I said, yeah, I was there in 1958. And she said, did you ever know Patsy Summers? And I said, yeah, I know. I knew Patsy Summers. Did you sleep with her? And he said, what, what, what? <laughs> he just kind of came awake. And I said, it's very important. Did you sleep with her? And he said, well, yeah. She said, congratulations, you have a daughter, and she's looking for you. And he just came awake like a shot. It was like, she's looking for me? And I said, yes. As soon as I heard some of the details, I knew immediately she was my daughter. And it, I don't want to say it was matter of fact, but I just knew that she was my daughter and that we had to be together and we, I had to see her and I had to respond. Nine days and dozens of phone calls later, Duncan Gilmore and his wife Suzanne arrived in Houston, Texas. On May 3rd, 1991, father and daughter met for the first time in their lives. Hi. Hi. When I hugged my dad, it was a combination of being really, really happy, but also uh, there was a little sadness there that so many years have gone by and that we've missed out on each other's lives. I love you. I love you, too. Uh, I will always remember Jeannie coming to the door and for the first time seeing my daughter and, and holding her. The day was made even more special when Duncan met his only grandchildren, okay. Joshua and Justin, for the first time. When I saw my boys playing catch with their grandpa, it, it just felt right. They needed a grandpa, and I can't think of a better grandpa for them to have. Push me. Never could I have hoped Ready? in a million years or prayed a thousand prayers for this to turn out as well as it has. And he's turned out to be everything that I thought he was going to be. Yeah, you did. And tomorrow and the day after, I'll now have a dad who loves me and wants to be a part of my life. When we return, a respected judge has been accused of stealing more than $10 million from his friends and neighbors. Newport, New Hampshire, population 7,000, reflects the values that America was built upon. A small town where successive generations are born and grow old, where everyone knows everyone else, where relationships are founded on honesty and trust. But on a quiet morning in May of 1989, a crack appeared in that foundation. Judge John Fairbanks, a lifelong resident, asked his court clerk to find a replacement for him and left town. At the time, no one imagined that Newport would never be the same again. Judge John C. Fairbanks was a respected jurist, a successful attorney whose family had lived in the Newport, New Hampshire area for three generations. On June 6, 1989, Residents were astonished by the news that Fairbanks had resigned his judgeship and abandoned his law practice. A few days later, their shock turned to outrage. This pillar of the community was apparently the worst kind of thief, a man who'd stolen more than $10 million from his friends and neighbors. You understand that you have a right to present evidence on your behalf? For 33 years, Judge behalf, Fairbanks presided over the District Court of Newport. I'll get to that later. Because Newport is a small community, Fairbanks court duties were limited, and he was able to maintain a lucrative law practice specializing in probate law. John was a nice guy. Everybody in the community liked him. Uh, nobody had a bad word for him. He just loved his family. Uh, loved his children, his grandchildren. 
just a great guy. Fairbanks was honest. I mean, that was his reputation. You might knock him for other things, but the one thing everybody ever always said about John Fairbanks was he was honest. So these people had complete faith and trust and confidence in him. When a client died, Judge Fairbanks would visit his widow, not just to offer condolences, but to relieve her of her financial worries. Nice of you to see. Well, my husband grew up with Judge Fairbanks here in town. The families were very friendly. And through the years, anything pertaining to law, he would go to Judge Fairbanks. John Fairbanks was settling my uncle's estate. And then, of course, I had the estate and I had income tax to do. And I knew him, so I went back to him for income taxes. And I went to him every year for doing my income tax. Patricia Sawyer had been coming to the judge for advice since 1958. In August of 1987, she agreed to turn over her stock certificates to Fairbanks so he could inventory her holdings. He called me on the phone and asked about my getting, could I get the stocks that day? I'll take that, Patricia. Judge Fairbanks and I had talked about doing an estate plan and changing my will. So many people had died. If you just lay all that out on my desk. When we got to Judge Fairbanks' office, he said he would inventory them and he would let me know how much they were worth and we would get together and make the will. Now, let's see what we have here. Is this everything, Patricia? This is everything. You're sure? Yes. Your uncle didn't have any deposits in any other banks. No. But he never got back to me, well, and I list I prodded and, uh, John a few times, but he was awful busy, and he hadn't got to it. And uh, then we'll be able to plan the estate. Yes. <laughs> Patricia, you don't have any idea how much this is worth. I you? have no idea. All right. There. October 12, 1987, Black Monday on Wall Street. The repercussions were felt worldwide even in Judge Fairbanks' courtroom. How fast were you going? 60. How do you know you were going 60? Well, I almost never could. We'll uh, take a brief recess. All rise, please. The stock market crash I remember very, very well. It was the judge's 65th birthday. He made a couple comments about Turning 65 is just wonderful. The stock market crashes on your 65th birthday. The secret of a stock market crash is not to panic. Hello, Ed. Now, what's the problem? He How said if he panicked, it? that he would lose over well, $3 million in the crash, the other but that he wasn't going to panic. Second, he made it through court real quick and left the building, but I was real concerned uh, about him. Account. His, his uh, mannerisms were different. He was very, very withdrawn that day. John, when am I going to be getting some dividends? Oh, you'll be getting it Within soon. a month, well, the effects of the so. crash had trickled down to Patricia Sawyer. I asked him why I wasn't getting dividend checks, and he said that due to the stock market crash, my stocks had gone down, and he was turning the dividends back in to bring the stocks up to where they were before the crash, before the, the drop in the stock market. And I believed that. I called Fairbanks in the spring of 88 because I had not been receiving accountings, and it was at that time that he told me that uh, he had been spending my brother's principal. John Tweedy had engaged Fairbanks as legal guardian for his brother Richard after their mother died. Richard Tweedy is a schizophrenic who has been institutionalized in a New Hampshire hospital for more than 40 years. In November of 1988, John Tweedy insisted that Fairbanks meet him face to face to discuss concerns about his brother's holdings. John, how are you? How are you, John? Good well, to like you. you wanted, I brought the account. Well, very good. I'm glad you did. I had certain questions yeah, to ask him about the estate. I mean, there was rhetoric in his response, oh, but he didn't you? answer the questions. Don't worry about that, John. Here, I want you to take a look at this. Well, I will, but maybe you can answer something else. 
When are my brother's estate going to the red? Well, John, I haven't got all those figures up here in my head. But you come back to my office later in the week, and I'll lay it all out for you. Well, it was at that time I found out that 75% uh, of my brother's money was gone. Why didn't you inform me when his estate went into the red? Oh, John, I tried to, but you're a hard man to find. Now, look, I've got another appointment. You come in later in the week, and we'll take care of everything. See you later, John. OK, John. Take care. <clears throat> If my brother's estate was in the red, and he knew my brother's equity in the real estate, if he was going to really take care of my brother's affairs, he would have notified me at that time and said, we have to sell some land. But he didn't. Why didn't he? Well, of course, I was to find out why he didn't. John Tweedy refused to accept the judge's explanations about his brother's estate and began his own investigation. I found that he had sold stock, and he had underreported what he had gotten for the stock. Uh, he had underreported what he had gotten for dividends. And after a couple of weeks of this, I came up with $20,000 that was missing. Uh, it turned out that was only a part of what was missing, but that was all I could determine from public records. And it was at that point I realized that, uh, well, he was embezzling. And uh, I've been raised to believe that when you see a crime committed, you call the cops, and so I... Uh, Call the cops. We drove over to look at Fairbanks's house here in Newport, and uh, we saw the house, and we felt, gee, that's got to be five hundred thousand dollars. We were aware that he had a home in Agunquit, Maine, which is a pretty expensive area to live, right on the ocean, that was worth six or seven hundred thousand dollars. And we looked at each other and said, "This guy's a thief." Judge Fairbanks' house of cards was tumbling down. On June 6, 1989, he resigned from the bench and retreated to his summer home in Maine. When John Tweedy's charges were made public, other disgruntled clients began to come forward with their suspicions. I had no idea that he was doing anything underhandedly until all this came out that morning. Judge Fairbanks had taken several other people, not only my account, but others in town. I wasn't the only one. He put these stocks into this stock brokerage firm as my agent, and I had never signed any papers, given him any authority. I had never signed my name on the certificates. He had done that illegally. Fairbanks had, in my opinion, had been doing this for so long that he had sort of milk dry most of the accounts that he had been stealing from. And uh, along came Patricia Soria, who had almost a million dollars in assets that he got in his hands. And it was like a gold mine, and he pounced on it. Authorities now suspect that over a 20-year period, Fairbanks may have stolen more than $10 million. As the investigation reached its climax, Judge Fairbanks spoke with Tom Hannigan from his home in Maine. I told him that all I wanted to do was to have him produce documents which would show that uh, his accounting was uh, true and correct. Look, I, I, let's keep this as quiet as possible. I, I don't want this to become a big thing. We agreed to a meeting. Okay. And then he called me maybe a week before the meeting okay, and said back. that he had to postpone it. And I said, OK, and he, we set another date. And then when the next date came up, I came over to Newport, New Hampshire, to interview uh, Fairbanks, and he wasn't there. Finally, on December 28, 1989, the judge was indicted on four counts of theft. The indictments listed more than 100 checks written by Fairbanks, which transferred money from client accounts to Fairbanks' personal accounts. The next day, Fairbanks' pickup truck was found abandoned near his house in Maine. The judge had disappeared and has not been seen since. This has affected my life to the fact that I wonder what I'm going to do, and I'm going to have to sell land, maybe sell the farm. And the farm has been in my family since the original settlers came from Massachusetts with the rock steams. Well, I was in total shock. I still don't think I've come out of it. 
I just can't believe that anyone could do such a thing. He had a double life. He had two, two totally separated lives. And uh, one of them was fine. You know, one of them was a, a man of uh, great integrity, uh, respected by the community. And the other, uh, <laughs> the other one was, well, classical. You know, he was into all sorts of things which are very shaky, very shady, and quite immoral. And very few, if anybody, knew the two existed. Next, the search for a set of twins who were separated from their family just after they were born. Growing up in the 50s in Red Hill, Alabama, life was slow and easy. Every day seemed pretty much like another. But when Sue Scribner, the fifth of 10 children, was 13 years old, one day held an extraordinary surprise. I'll never forget the day I came home from church. It was January 1957. Oh, hi, Mom. My mother was alone in the house, which was unusual because the kids usually were all around. So what did you do today? Oh, I just been reading the paper. What is this? She had written two names all over the newspaper, so I asked her about that. What does this mean, Mom? She just said she had seen the names and she was writing it. Mom, have you been crying? Yeah, honey, just a little. When I asked her why she had been crying, she told me about having a boy and a girl twin that had been adopted. It's time I told you. Told me what? I was really surprised because I was 13. And, it, and it's a shock to find out that you have a brother and sister that you didn't know about, especially when you already have so many brothers and sisters. Two years before you were born, I gave premature birth to two twins, a boy and a girl. Sue's mother, Callista, began to unburden herself. It had all begun in Winter Garden, Florida, at Orange County General Hospital. Slim, hurry. Okay, okay, honey. Hurry, Slim. In January 1942, Callista went into labor nearly two months early. She and Sue's father, Slim Scribner, were frantic when they arrived at the emergency room. Doctor, with you just a minute. Excuse me, but could somebody please help me? My, my wife's going into premature labor. Oh, your doctor's name? Dr. Harder. Dr. Harder. Orderly, we need a wheelchair here right away. Please take her to delivery. Let me call Dr. Harder. The twins were born a short time later. Callista and Slim named them Paul and Paula after their doctor, Paul Harder. But they're so small, they're premature. We have some serious health problems. We have a heart condition and a blood disorder. Are they gonna be okay, doctor? Well, we think so. But they will require a great deal of medical attention. I asked my mother why they were adopted, and she said that um, they needed some sort of surgery for a congenital heart disease or a heart problem, and that uh, they couldn't afford that. I know it's a difficult decision, but it's the best choice for everyone. She said that um, Dr. Harder knew someone perfect to adopt the twins and that um, they would be able to pay for the medical expenses. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I appreciate everything. The twins being adopted, it just stayed with her forever. She never got over it. Before Callista Scribner left the hospital, she made a solemn promise to Dr. Harder that she would never search for the twins. In 1944, she and Slim were divorced. Callista remarried, and with a new husband, eventually raised 10 children. After Callista's death in 1979, her daughter Sue enlisted the entire family to look for the twins. But the search went nowhere. Both Dr. Harder and Sue's father were dead, and the hospital records sealed. 
Then a rusty trunk in an attic finally yielded a clue. In 1987, one of Sue's cousins found a letter which Callista Scribner had written to her mother a short time after the twins were born. Sue's cousin was surprised that the letter never mentioned adoption. In fact, it seemed that Callista had every intention of bringing the twins home. The babies are still improving. The first time they weighed them at the Orange General, Paula weighed two and three fourths pounds and Paul two and a half pounds. They told us the day before yesterday that they weighed three pounds, 14 ounces, and three pounds, 11 ounces. So they're gaining right along and also said they might be able to bring them home by the first of next week. When I read the letter that mother wrote, it was almost exactly like she had told me in 1957. The only thing that the letter didn't clear up was why the twins were adopted. Because she, from the letter, you can tell that she did not intend for them to be adopted. The discovery of Callista's letter sparked new interest in the twins. Several newspaper articles followed, and one of them paid off. Hello? In May of 1990, one of Sue's nieces, who lives in Mobile, Alabama, received an anonymous phone call. OK. The twins are fine. I know the family. They don't know they're adopted. The caller seemed elderly and very emotional. She said she knew where Paul and Paula were. The caller refused to divulge her relationship with the twins, but did say that she planned to tell them they were adopted on Mother's Day. Mother's Day. And I'm going to try and tell them the whole truth. You'll be hearing from me in a couple of weeks, or else the, the twins will contact you directly. That's all. I called everybody in the family, and this is it. We found the twins. You know, we're going to hear from them or, you know, whoever the, the lady was that called. And uh, counting the days, and when the day came Sunday, counting the hour, <laughs> when, and I would not leave home. <laughs> but nothing ever happened. As a last resort, Sue wrote an open letter to the twins, which was published both in Florida and in Louisiana newspapers. And so elusive twins, I still search. I write letters. I stare at strangers with hazel eyes and fair skin. Yet should my efforts end in emptiness, my voice in oblivion, I must tell you this. I have not failed so completely, for I have already found you once, years ago, chasmed in that deep, indelible well, that safe place, our mother's heart. Ten days after we featured this story, Sue Scribner received an anonymous call from one of our viewers who told her that the twins were living in Orlando, Florida. Sue immediately contacted her brother and sister, whose names are Bruce and Barbara. The twins had no idea that they had been adopted and were shocked to learn about a side of their family they never knew existed. On March 15, 1992, Sue Scribner met her brother and sister for the first time in her life. The joyous reunion brought together six of the Scribner children and their families. The very first time I met them, I think all of our knees were shaking. It is emotional, but I think we've all cried enough tears and we didn't need a lot today. I think that my newfound family is wonderful. I think they're absolutely adorable. It's like we've known each other all of our lives, even though we haven't been around each other more than five hours. You can lose me for another 50 years. I can't wait to get to know them. I'm really very excited about it. And, uh, you have all these questions in your mind. Gee, what did I miss out on all these years? What were they really like as kids? She used to be small. <laughs> I think everybody's going to get to know each other, both sides of the family. And uh, for the country bumpkins like we are, it's like a blessing. It doesn't really matter now what kind of life any of us had, because it's, it's what's left that counts. We know where all of the children are now.
Join me next time for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries.